Good evening. Uh, yep. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for tonight's chronic cough update in partnership with St George Hospital. My name is Bertha Harvey, and I'm the CPD and Events Manager at Central East and Sydney PHN. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this nation. I acknowledge the traditional custodians uh, and sovereign people of the land across which we work and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. So before we continue, I would like to quickly introduce Dr Martina Gleeson, who will be going through the health pathways for this topic. Thanks, Martina. Uh, thanks, Bertha, and thanks, everybody. Those of you who participate will be familiar with these slides. Um, these are the login details for your local health pathways and um, they, if you haven't already accessed it and you don't have a login, um, there's a button to request access on the homepage of both of the health pathways iterations for our region um, and the team will rapidly send you a username and password so that you can access them. Um, we recommend that you use Sydney, if you're referring a patient to services in the Sydney Local Health District and Southeastern Sydney, if you're referring a patient to services in the Southeastern Health District. Um, if you've got a pathway that you've looked for and you haven't found, please uh, feel free to nominate a pathway because we're planning our work program for next year and we really value um, the opinions and the requests from our GP users. Um, the health pathways that are relevant to tonight's talk um, are listed here. There is actually one on chronic cough in adults, persistent cough in children, and psychogenic cough in children, cough in palliative care and whooping cough, and then the referral pathways, non-acute respiratory assessment, non-acute ENT assessment, and adult speech pathology assessment with others in development. Um, if you are a GP colleague who takes referrals from other GPs uh, for your special interest, please uh, feel free to nominate yourself um, and we'd be happy to list your practice for your special interest. And uh, we've got some pathways in review at the moment that are listed on that slide. And uh, if you've used them and you've got some feedback on them, we welcome your feedback. We just ask you to press on the send feedback button and that will come to our team. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Martina. I would now like to, to introduce Dr. Zeng, who is a respiratory and sleep physician and staff specialist at St. George Hospital. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity um, to share an update on chronic cough. Uh, so I'm a respiratory and sleep physician and staff specialist at St. George Hospital. Um, and one of the more common referrals in the public and private sector is chronic cough. Uh, it can be tricky and somewhat less rewarding disorder to investigate and manage in both, um, I guess, primary and specialty care setting. Uh, I'm only going to talk about chronic cough, which is defined uh, longer than eight weeks. Um, so not covering acute or subacute cough um, or cough in children. Um, so, But some of the principles do cross over um, in terms of the general cough investigation and management. So in terms of uh, objectives, um, I'll cover the general overview of chronic cough and the workup algorithm um, using two uh, cases to illustrate this. Um, this includes recognizing red flags that require early intervention and referral. Um, we'll also dis uh, you know, discuss the diagnosis and management of the more common associated condition, you know, the big three reflux, asthma, and uh, upper airway cough syndrome. Um, here I present them as treatable traits. And then finally, um, go, I'm going to discuss or introduce the concept of cough hypersensitivity, um, its relevance to chronic cough management, um, and then discuss what sort of available treatments currently and potential uh, treatment options in the future. Um, and this is an area uh, so far we haven't met the patient's care needs. Uh, so you know, to start off with the cough reflex and understanding the cough reflex is important. I promise this is the only um, biology slide uh, for this talk. Um, it's useful to work through the differential diagnosis as well as understanding how uh, patients develop sensitization. 
So the stimulation of uh, cough reflex begins by activation of the cough receptors um, shown here. Um, and uh, that these cough receptors are located in the upper and lower respiratory tracts. So larynx, trachea, bronchus, and lung. Um, but they're also situated in the pericardium, esophagus, stomach, and diaphragm, which is important when it comes to differential diagnosis. There are two types of uh, sensory fibers. Uh, so there's the C fibers, which forms a dense network of thin fibers um, that predominantly respond to chemical triggers, so such as capsaicin um, and uh, uh, temperature changes, um, as well as um, uh, smoke and fumes. Um, later, I'll talk about the this these two or this one in particular, P2X3 um, receptor, um, which is relevant to the new drug developments. And this is a, a sensor for inflammation, um, which it's uh, ligand is the ATP. Um, the A-delta fibers are a mechanical um, receptor, so they sense, sense vibration. Um, both the um, A-delta and the C-fibers respond to acid, um, which is relevant to the reflux. Um, on top, so these pathways are transmitted via the vagus nerve um, to the uh, cough center in the brainstem. The cough center itself is under central um, modulation. So impulses uh, from the cough can be amplified uh, by the sensory and motor cortex and linked up with the emotion with the insula and the amygdala. And so this is relevant to um, hypersensitivity as well as um, the psychological um, stress or psychological input uh, into chronic cough. Um, so there are some sex related differences in cough reflex sensitivity. And as we'll discuss later, um, there's differences between healthy controls and uh, chronic cough patients in terms of their response to low level um, irritants. Um, hence, um, the idea of helpful cough and the unwanted cough. Um, we all understand the helpful cough, it provides protection against aspiration, inhalation of potentially harmful particles and chemicals. It keeps the lung from drowning from excessive mucus. Uh, and for um, patients and doctors, it is a symptom of disease. However, on the other end of the spectrum, um, cough can be precipitated by you know, minor uh, low level physiological triggers eliciting an excessive response. So it's no longer protective and it is actually potentially harmful in the form of cough begets more coughing. In turn, it itself is a disease and can cause physical psychosocial harm to the patient. So what are the potential impacts? Um, so in a typical patient with chronic cough, they can cough hundreds, um, even thousands of times per day. So similar to those with acute uh, viral cough, except uh, as we know, it persists for months or years. Um, chronic cough can lead to a bunch, you know, a numerous unwanted um, physical harm. So, particularly in females, um, one third, although not is not often revealed in the initial consultation, would suffer from incontinence. Um, I've had referrals from the emergency department with uh, cough-related syncope, and this is important. Um, to seek out for as it has uh, driving implications. Uh, it is an issue with regards to insomnia and you know, impacting on the sleep of the patient as well as their partners, um, common cause of musculoskeletal injury and even rib fractures. In the setting of um, these COVID years, um, the chronic cough itself is a negative stigmata. So um, leads to absenteeism from work, um, and impact on their professional development. And all of these develop, um, result in you know, psychological stress in the form of embarrassment, um, anger and frustration and the lack of a diagnosis or treatment efficacy um, and long-term uh, mental health issues as well as lower quality of life. Um, so what is the burden of chronic cough? Um, so, in Western countries, it's estimated um, between 10 to 12% globally, so some point in a patient's life to, to suffer from chronic cough. Um, in, 
um, I guess, developing countries is estimated lower, less than 5%. Um, in Australia, um, observational studies suspect it's over 15%. As we discussed, it's more prevalent in females than males and most commonly present in the fifth to sixth decade of life. Um, so whether it's um, over time exposure leading to hypersensitivity, in addition to some of the diseases developing later in life. The economic cost is unclear, but as we know, it is a common um, cause of uh, you know, patient presentation. So I believe cough is one of the most common encounters to the primary care practice, um, you know, mostly acute. Um, but chronic cough results in multiple presentations um, over period, uh, you know, a long period of time to multiple different healthcare members across a wide range of specialties. Um, and sometimes they rotate through you know, um, multiple you know, different specialists. So account for uh, substantial cost um, in terms of Medicare and, and the cost of investigations in addition to the cost of um, empirical trials and side effects from uh, treatment trials and investigations. There are multiple challenges of managing chronic cough. On one hand, you have to, um, you know, it could reflect the underlying life or organ threatening conditions, so require prompt diagnosis and referral. Um, it's associated with common diseases in itself um, that, you know, is also common in the population without necessarily triggering cough. It can be associated with more than one of the big three that we talk, we'll talk about later. And unfortunately, it's not always therapy responsive and it's, there's not always a clear cause and effect. Um, and it can be due to a number of, um, you know, there's a wide differential of less common pathologies that can be missed as well. And again, balancing the cost of over investigation and as we saw quite a prevalent condition versus the harm of delayed diagnosis of potentially something that's treatable uh, or serious. And then the, the biggest issue, obviously, the significant um, proportion of chronic coughers still have persistent cough, and that's despite, despite empirical therapy and extensive investigation. So sort of identifying those with the potential chronic hyper, um, cough hypersensitivity syndrome. And I'll use two um, cases to highlight some of these uh, challenges. Dr. Zeng, before you move on to the next section, just a quick question. Um, what are the theories regarding high rates of chronic cough in Australia compared to other countries? Uh, yep, so um, uh, I guess uh, one, uh, in, so in terms of comparing to uh, developing countries, they you know, generally have more acute issues in terms of acute chronic cough. Um, maybe they're less likely to present um, with less serious coughs. Um, uh, in terms of why Australia versus other Western countries, um, probably depends on how hard you look. Um, as I'll probably present later, some of the um, research in terms of treatment of chronic cough, whether it's speech pathology or pharmacotherapy, um, came from Australia. So there might be more awareness um, or understanding to diagnose chronic cough. Um, so I think that accounts for some of the changes. I'm not aware of any, you know, environmental factor. Um, and and the, I guess the biology of chronic cough in terms of its development is not clear. Um, so um, there, there is some uncertainty regarding that. Right, thank you. Um, so case one is a 66-year-old gentleman. Um, he has a long-standing dry chronic cough. Um, however, over the past year has developed increasingly productive cough of clear phlegm, and that's, been, that's associated with hoarse voice and dysphonia. So already there's some alarm bells. Um, he is an ex-smoker, 20 packet history. He's a re retired engineer. Um, he has a background of atrial fibrillation on um, anticoagulation therapy and metoprolol. Um, his cough has been, uh, so I guess his background dry cough um, has been associated with reflux and for which he's on a long-term PPI. How do I unpause the screen sharing? Uh, does that? Um... Yeah, that's moved on to the next slide. Yep. Yeah, so um, this brings uh, about uh, chronic cough challenge one, which is initial assessment of chronic cough, um, and in terms of structured um, 
uh, flow, ch flow sheet and having a prompt di diagnosis of a more serious pathology. Um, so what are the important things we try to seek? So um, the first thing is trying to identify any red flags um, that would you know, alter the, um, the diagnostic algorithm. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, other important factors, the onset. Um, so any potential triggers, is it possible aspiration of a foreign body, any environmental exposures or new exposures that might have triggered the cough. The duration is important. Um, so obviously the longer the duration, the potentially more likely that there is less, or less likely there's something sinister going on. Any particular triggers, um, the, the volume, I guess the um, strength of the triggers, uh, particular timing in terms of day versus night. Is a productive or dry, um, you know, productive cough again might set you on a different investigation pathway, looking more at you know sinus disease or suppurative lung disease. Uh, the pattern and the quality in terms of the sound quality, which might give clues whether there's um, some upper airway pathology or uh, tracheobronchial malacia. Any associated symptoms that might point to a particular source in terms of GI, chest, and throat, um, and link with that any you know, early signs of treatable traits in terms of the big three we talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, sleep apnea syndrome and so forth, uh, symptoms and so forth. And something that we don't often talk about because we're so engrossed in finding out why they cough is, you know, impact on their quality of life. And is there any other physical harm that we haven't picked up? Uh, we discuss exposure history. In terms of medication, I think it's done very well. I hardly ever see a chronic cough referral that, um, with the patient still on their ACE inhibitors. Um, so just to highlight, um, 15 to 20% of people on ACE inhibitors can develop chronic cough. Um, there's a lag time between a week to six months from commencement of the medication to cough onset. And it can have ongoing effects for three months after cessation. Um, as we know, it increases um, bradykinin levels um, by uh, you know, preventing their breakdown and as a result, sensitize the airway uh, to coughing. So it does make treating cough difficult, even if the cough might be due to another, um, another source. So we recommend stopping um, the ACE inhibitor, even if the temporal relationship isn't established and convert them to ARB. Um, focused exam based on the history, um, obviously the cardiopulmonary system uh, and the upper airway system. Um, Investigations, so chest X-ray involved, again, um, you know, quite obvious and um, every patient who has been referred with a chronic cough to the Richard um, Clinic has had an X-ray. Um, again, an abnormal chest X-ray would set you off a different investigation pathway, i.e. CT um, versus a normal chest X-ray. In terms of other investigations available to the GP clinic, so spirometry, blood test and sputum, if it is a productive cough, um, so blood tests looking for infective um, um, uh, biomarkers as well as eosinophil count, spirometry to rule out um, query asthma or COPD, um, basically a, a lower airways disease. Uh, so in terms of uh, chronic cough red flags, um, so hemoptysis, we think uh, you know potential upper airway or lower airway cancer um, or potential tuberculosis in the relevant population. Um, if they've got a relevant smoking history, particularly if there's a uh, you know change in their cough, um, as with our patient, um, any prominent dis um, breathlessness, um, any upper airway symptoms in terms of voice hoarseness uh, or trouble swallowing, eating or drinking, um, su suggesting esophageal symptoms, uh, and again any systemic symptoms of concern. Uh, we talk about the abnormal chest X-ray and abnormal respiratory exam. So I've highlighted some of these potential um, diagnosis or concerns in, in um, uh, box two. Um, the blue ones are you know, relevant uh, from a St. George Healthcare Pathway perspective. Um, just to mention, we've got a rapid access clinic now in terms of um, lung nodules or lung cancer that, you, uh, that needs to be seen promptly. Um, as you guys are aware, there's an ILD clinic and MDT. IOD NDT um, and St. George, um, we have a chest clinic um, and then bronchiectasis and other parenchymal lung disease with our general respiratory clinic. And again, this will, you know, determine, identifying these red flags will determine the urgency of referrals, um, you know, different specialty pathways um, and further workup in imaging. So going back to our case, um, 
Uh, so further history, so no purulence or hemoptysis. Of concern, it appears to be triggered by oral intake. So coughing and aspiration symptoms when eating fast, but no dysphagia or food bolus symptoms. It is worse at night. Um, uh, again, in addition to the hoarse voice and dysphonia, um, but there's no neurological weakness and he has a stable weight. <clears throat> He's had a previous x-ray um, several years ago, which was normal. Uh, and it was, as we discussed, he's on a PPI for suspected chronic cough associated reflux. He hasn't had any relevant recent exposure exam um, other than sort of transmitted bronchial breast sounds and right basal crackles, which is mostly normal, um, including a normal neurological exam. Um, so his lung function test, which uh, was unremarkable, so normal spirometry without bronchodilator response. Um, he had a CT sinus, given that you know, um, so he's got to gone down to the moist cough, um, chronic cough pathway. So mild mucosa thickening, some changes suggest of mild chronic sinusitis. His CT neck in the setting of his dysphonia was um, no significant abnormality. CT chest showed right low, low, lower lobe changes of consolidation and endobronchial plugging. Um, and this might be related to um, aspiration in terms of the location of the lung changes. Um, and as you can see, um, sorry, it's a non-contrast scan. Um, this is um, arteria lusoria, so a aberrant right subclavian artery, which is quite common and generally not an issue. Um, however, in this case, in this instance, maybe gradual age-related dilation and stiffening of his great vessels uh, may have led to um, reduced ability of his, of his esophagus to accommodate food and liquid. Um, causing um, aspiration. So suspect, suspected aspiration due to dysphagia lusoria, he was referred to a gastroenterologist for esophageal dilatation. His productive, productive cough improved post-treatment. His ongoing dry cough can persist, um, but he didn't want to pursue any further investigation or treatment from that perspective. We'll move on to case two. This is a, a 28. Just, uh, then just before you go on to the next case, yeah. there's just two uh, questions there. So uh, the first one is, I had a previously well non-smoking, non-asthmatic patient who developed a chronic dry cough after sedation for colonoscopy and gastroscopy with a normal chest x-ray. Can mild aspiration cause it and how do you treat it? Uh, um, so how, I guess I don't know how long the cough went for. Um, uh, in terms of your yeah, aspiration, I, I expect it to be um, sort of short-term symptoms, um, and you know it certainly can cause cough and um, irritation. Um, in terms of uh, treatment, if it is aspiration, usually those are chemical um, pneumonitis and doesn't require any antibiotic therapy. Um, look, yeah, even. Uh, I'm not an ID physician, so sometimes um, we still give some antibiotics, um, and it, usually just to cover the um, sort of oral or gastric flora and doesn't require metronidazole or augmentin. In, in terms of other potential causes, particularly if it's a protracted cough, um, as we'll discuss later, there are cough receptors in the esophagus and gastric. So irritation um, or ir injury to those areas might have precipitated the cough. Um, I, I'm not aware of any issues with anesthetic that they may have given. Um, so I probably suspect some sort of um, post, you know, procedural irritation. But I haven't uh, seen many post-procedural cough that, that's, you know, protracted longer than eight weeks. And the second one is, can't ARB to a lesser degree cause cough? Yes. Um, yes is the answer, but um, to a much lesser degree. Um, uh, the sensitization is much less so than the ACE inhibitor. Um, and we're usually happy to just leave them on the ARB um, in that instance, unless there's a clear, again, temporal relationship between, you know, starting the ARB. Um, and there's a bunch of other um, medications um, that can also sensitize the cough. Um, like I said, Tresto was one of the ones that um, from a previous case might have caused it, um, although it's sort of a balance between their cardiac needs. Um, in that case. Happy if I uh, move on? Yep. Uh, so yeah, so second case, suspected sleep apnea, no major medical history, 
medications. He's a non-smoker, uh, doesn't drink alcohol. Um, he was, you know, originally referred for sleep apnea, but um, incidentally, um, he had a cough complaint and GP organized a chest X-ray. And since they were coming to see me for sleep, might as well, you know, review the X-ray issues, which showed some highly lymphadenopathy, which um, in this gentleman raised the possibility of underlying sarcoid, uh, which might have also explained the cough. Um, so uh, his initial findings, so moderate severe sleep apnea, he had, um, you know, typical examination findings um, to suggest underlying OSA. Um, so his X-ray findings didn't match the subsequent CT. So the CT didn't show any evidence of mediastinal or hyaline lymphadenopathy. <clears throat> there was no, um, you know, periphyseal, um, there was no nodules in essence to suggest underlying um, parenchymal sarcoid, um, no fibrosis, no bronchitis, a small hiatus hernia. So in essence, um, no major significant findings from a lung, airway or parenchymal perspective to explain his chronic cough. Um, so further history, mild exertional breathlessness, no wheeze, um, more frequent during the day rather than nighttime. He denies any nasal congestion, but has had some post-nasal symptoms. Describes globus sensation, which is, um, you know, that feeling that something's stuck in the throat, which is triggered by food intake. And he was already trialed of previous short-term period of PPI and Gaviscon. And this leads to our chronic cough challenge too. So diagnosis and treatment of commonly associated diseases, um, which you know, can be termed treatable traits. I know this is quite in, in, in fashion or um, may potentially overused recently. So in terms of dilemmas, um, so in the community, we have high prevalence of reflux, rhinosinusitis and asthma. Um, the investigations around them usually rule it out as a cause of cough. So we're happy you know, if the uh, lung function testing doesn't prove asthma um, or, you know, if the pH um, uh, monometry or impedance stenosis testing doesn't show reflux, uh, or if there's no signs of rhinitis or sinusitis on um, nasal endoscopy, to say that's not the cause of a chronic cough. But when it is present, we're not, you know, we're not certain that it is relevant to the cough. So is it a, was it a, is it a precipitant? Is it an ongoing perpetuating factor in terms of chronic irritation, or is it a bystander where association may not equate to causation? So in the in the specialty sense, there's a lot of you know fingerprinting pointing. Um, I'm also guilty of that in the sense that oh look, it's not asthma. The lungs are clear on the X-ray and CT. Um, it's not us. Um, maybe gastro, maybe ENT, um, and sometimes it's sort of a circular um, past the parcel. Um, with these patients. So what are the treatable traits in chronic cough? Um, I will cover asthma, gourd, and rhinosinusitis in more detail. <clears throat> uh, so in terms of sleep apnea and obesity, which is what um, our patient has. Um, so sleep apnea, um, the mechanism could be uh, due to reflux or upper um, airway uh, mechanical irritation during snoring or um, repeated episodes of apnea. Um, CPAP therapy has been shown in, uh, in small observational trials to reduce chronic cough. Um, so by all means, in the appropriate patient where you suspect they have sleep apnea, investigate it and treat it. Um, obesity is more common in those with chronic cough. Um, again, maybe it's due to reflux, maybe it's the pro-inflammatory um, factor from obesity, um, generally uncertain. We already spoke, you know, talked about smoking and ACE inhibitors, smoking and also vaping um, in this case can cause up airway irritation. And so that's an appropriate cough response to expel um, you know, inhaled irritants. Suppurative lung disease or purulent um, 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 lung disease. So in this case, airway clearance education with phys physiotherapy um, and antibiotics and mucolytics may be helpful. So asthma or non-asthmatic is sonophilic bronchitis, um, and cough may be the only symptom in cough here in asthma. The difference between non-asthmatic EB um, versus asthma is that there is airway inflammation, but without evidence of bronchial hyperresponsiveness on a bronchial provocation challenge. So from a respiratory perspective, we usually put them through um, spirometry, looking for bronchodilator response and plus or minus bronchial provocation challenge. 
um, a positive bronchodilator response or a negative bronchodilator response does not necessarily um, predict uh, the results or the outcome of the bronchi bronchoprovocation uh, testing. Um, pheno is you know, quite useful. Um, so a moderately elevated pheno, so above 30 to 40 um, parts per billion, has a moderate sensitivity to e predict either coffee and asthma or eosinophilic uh, bronchitis. So positive predictive value of 90%, a positive likelihood ratio of six. And it's highly suggestive of uh, inhaled cortical steroid responsive cough. Um, so would encourage uh, you know, patients to have a spirometry and pheno. Um, whereas bronchoprovocation challenge, although useful in differentiating asthma versus EV, um, may not necessarily predict whether they are going to be ICS um, responsive. Um, alternatively, if, if you know, in the um, primary care uh, world, this may not be access to pheno, so empirical short-term trial of ICS is appropriate uh, as per recent guidelines. Um, so two to four weeks um, to assess response. Um, just a reminder that Ventolin is not an antitussive. Sometimes patients do respond, but most likely that's due to a uh, placebo effect. In the setting of a low pheno and a normal spirometry and challenge, an ICS trial is not recommended. Um, and then um, the other thing to highlight, um, during the ICS trial, just due to their upper airway irritation, sometimes the dry powder inhaler can also trigger cough, in, in which case, um, in the appropriate patients, you might try them on a inhaler that's appropriately able to be delivered through a spacer to reduce um, the drug delivery related irritation. Um, so rhinosinusitis and chronic cough, so it could be allergic or non-allergic or vasomotor rhinitis, nasopharyngitis or chronic sinusitis. Again, cough can be the only symptom. Um, some other clues are so loss of smell, nasal congestion or post-nasal drip. Um, so post-nasal drip, again, is now becoming controversial. Um, it could be, uh, you know, excess mucus dribbling down the back, or it could be um, hypersensitization, so to physiological nasal secretions. In, in terms of diagnosis, um, so uh, on a rhinoscopy, maybe through ENT, um, so cobble, cobblestone changes, um, any signs of polyps, um, any excess secretions, and then sinus imaging, if, if you suspect of chronic sinusitis. Again, um, uh, well, in this case, evidence-based data or um, you know, RCT is lacking regarding treatment. Um, the guidelines recommend that empirical therapy with nasal steroids and antihistamine. Um, and if there's any features of chronic sinusitis, douching with um, you know, steroids uh, or sinus surgery if appropriate. However, there are no objective data on um, chronic cough and surgical outcome. And often, as um, you know, you guys might have encountered empirical therapy with these drugs, um, often disappointing results. Uh, reflux and chronic cough, um, that's um, a bit of a nightmare. It's a complex relationship. You know, where does cough lie in the spectrum of reflux um, between silent globus sensation, heartburn, and, you know, volumetric or active regurgitation? We're not sure the mechanism. Is it a mechanical distension of the lower esophagus? Is it acid or chemical irritation? Um, does it matter if it's acidic or non-acidic reflux? Um, is there a temporal re relationship? Is in what came first, the reflux or the cough? Does a cough trigger the reflux? Does, does a reflux trigger the cough? Um, previous guidelines suggested um, twice daily PPI for three months. Um, recent ERS and chest guidelines recommend against routinely prescribing antacids, so that's PPI and H2 antagonists, in those without peptic symptoms, so symptoms of um, acid reflux in the term of heartburn or regurgitation. So systematic reviews show no significant benefits over placebo. Um, as, as we'll later find, there's a huge placebo response in a lot of trials. Um, there was a trend towards benefit in those with dyspepsia, dyspepsia hence potentially consider a trial of PPI in those with um, appropriate gourd-related symptoms. And the recommended focus is now on diet modification, weight loss, and behavioral changes. And I think uh, maybe related to some of the PBS changes, I, I don't see many patients stuck on PPIs being referred from the primary care um, practice with, with you know, chronic cough assessment. 
Um, there's no evidence regarding promotility agents or anti-reflux surgery. The diagnosis would be, um, you know, the probably the gold standard would be 24-hour esophageal P8 and, and impedient, impedance, uh, not easily accessed and not pleasant for the patient. Um, so it's often used for those who have reflux-like symptoms that hasn't responded to PBI and is more of a rule out test. So if it is confirmed, again, we're not sure if the reflux is a cause of chronic cough, um, but if it's not confirmed, at least we can say there isn't major reflux as a cause or contributor to that chronic cough. In certain circumstances, consider gastric emptying disorder or esophageal dysmotility. Um, and in that case, you know, referring to gastroenterology. Um, just a um, short slide on laryngopharyngeal reflux. And this is retrograde movement of gastric contents into the laryngopharynx. Um, so similar symptoms could be dysphonia, hoarseness, dysphagia, global sensation, throat clearing. Um, again, it's not clear, is this a sensitization thing? Um, all of those changes could also be related to, to sensitization. So physiological reflux leading to cough. The diagnosis would be laryng uh, laryngoscopy, but there's poor agreement um, between uh, ENT surgeons. It tends to occur more upright, so increased intrathoracic pressure, so that it's the upper esophageal sphincter being affected rather than the lower esophageal sphincter with gastroesophageal reflux. So back to our case, um, so what are his treatable traits? Um, so he had a, ended up having a lung function test which showed a normal spirometry but positive bronchodilator response. His pheno was not, um, however, was not elevated. Yeah, his sleep study again confirmed moderate severe obstructive sleep apnea. We knew he has, has a BMI of 34. His CT already ruled out any parenchymal or you know, airways disease. He ended up did going, having a nucleus integrity. There was evidence of gastroesophageal reflux in association with high hernia, and there was upper, um, upper airway contamination. Um, so he had a um, you know, treatment trial, ICS larva, Again, put back on PPI, gave a skull with um, diet and lifestyle advice. Um, he was initiated on CPAP with sleep apnea um, and discussion regarding weight loss. He had a repeat lung function later, which didn't elicit any bronchodilator response. And he, subsequently, his ICS larva was stopped on the setting of his repeat spirometry as well as um, negative phenome. Unfortunately, no response to treatment so far. Um, so what are some of the less common conditions to consider or, or exclude? And that brings us um, to challenge three. So it could be due to a wide range of less common pathologies. Um, so going through uh, the differentials um, require um, sort of knowledge of that cough anatomy in terms of where the potential sensors are. And we talked about um, uh, the upper and lower airway, as well as the pericardium, uh, the stomach and esophagus and diaphragm. Um, there's also sinus innervation, as we um, um, talked about before, uh, through one of the uh, trigeminal nerve branches, as well as auricular. So um, here, um, the Arnold's um, reflex um, in terms of uh, external ear pathology can trigger cough. Uh, we talked about sleep apnea. Um, so some patients have a, a sort of a barking cough and suspect whether they've got tracheal bronchial malacia um, and sort of expiratory central airway collapse. Uh, patients um, with ventricular ectopics um, can also, uh, it also has been shown to be associated with chronic cough, so cardiac arrhythmias and obviously heart failure um, with C fibers from pulmonary edema. Um, Pan bronchiolitis in our patients just have a CT, but uh, you know you would not pick this up on a normal X-ray. Uh, interstitial lung disease, which has been ruled out. So some of the further investigations to consider, again, depending on the history and the index of suspicion, and to decide whether it's necessary. So I'm only going to talk about from a respiratory perspective. So the role of CT imaging, um, as we discussed, any red flags on exam or abnormal chest X-ray. Um, equates to a CT chest. Recent ERS guidelines suggest against um, routine X-rays for uh, sorry routine CTs if they have a normal X-ray and physical exam. However, um, uh, you know uh, this is not backed up by all the guidelines. And sort of chest X-ray can miss 
for 30, 40% of interstitial lung diseases as well as sarcoidosis. It won't pick up um, uh, airway lesions as well as the um, diffuse bronchi uh, bronchiolitis. Again, as we discussed, if they've got productive cough, that equates to a more of a suppurative um, uh, pathway, in which case we look for sinus disease and again, CT imaging for bronchiectasis, which may not be picked up on a chest X-ray. However, sometimes just because we find something on the CT imaging may not necessarily explain uh, their cough. Bronchoscopy, um, again, if there's any concerns regarding airway malignancy, tracheal bronchiomalacia, which may be missed on a CT. So if you really want to look for a tracheal bronchiomalacia, you have to order an inspiratory and expiratory phase CT, which may be difficult in those with chronic cough in terms of breath holding. Um, if there's suspicion of foreign body, so based on the history uh, at the time of onset, um, as well as to look for signs of inflammation, um, and sputum sampling for infection and eosinophilia. I didn't talk about it, but um, with regards to non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis, the gold standard is still sputum eosinophilia. Um, so sometimes a negative pheno may not uh, pick up um, uh, non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis. Uh, in one study, they or in one cough clinic, they found that 10% of um, patients who had normal chest imaging, lung function, and ENT evaluation later had uh, abnormalities on their bronchoscopy. But again, just like with the CT, it's uncertain if the abnormalities explained, um, explained their cough. Um, so back to case two, he had an ENT review. He was previously seen for barotrauma. We talked about the relationship between ear and cough. So he had normal external ear exam, um, mild nasal congestion on nasal endoscopy with no polyps and no um, uh, evidence of significant post-nasal drip, mild swelling, again, that was somewhat attributed to reflux with grade two tonsils. Um, again, tonsillar enlargement can also be a cause um, of chronic cough due to the upper airway irritation. His gastroscopy showed ongoing evidence of erosive reflux esophagitis. So, um, you know, there are signs that he has reflux and he does need to be on um, appropriate reflux treatment. So his treatment was increased. Later on, he had a bronchoscopy. In essence, nothing abnormal, no evidence of eosinophilia. So unfortunately, he has ongoing dry, irritating cough despite, you know, um, upping his reflux treatment. Um, you know, some of this, you know, treatable traits could be further optimized, but in essence, um, he's on treatment to try to target everything, but the cough is continuing. Um, and where to from here? And that brings us to the fourth um, or the final challenge in terms of the fact that significant proportion of patients still have persistent cough despite empirical therapy and extensive investigation. So recognizing the chronic hypersensitivity syndrome sorry, cough hypersensitivity syndrome. So, um, so one uh, study found that up to 42% of chronic cough sufferers still have persistent cough despite optimization of treatable traits and associated conditions. Um, so it's divided into two. Uh, so unexplained chronic cough or idiopathic cough as it's previously known. So cause of cough not identified despite thorough investigation or refractory chronic cough. So cough does not resolve after empirical or etiological um, directed therapy. Um, okay, I lied, there's a second biology slide. Um, so this is in the setting of dysregulation of sensory neural, neurons. Um, so it could be peripheral or central uh, sensitization. Um, so in terms of peripheral sensitization, there's inflammatory irritation of the vague sensory nerve at the receptors. We talked about ATP. Um, with a P3X2 um, um, channel. And centrally, there's a reduced ability to suppress the cough due to altered um, descending pathways, descending networks. So unable to suppress the cough. Um, and then altered cortical processing of sensory information. So this um, the sensory cortex um, further exaggerates um, the cough uh, signal and the motor response to cough. So when we compare patients with chronic cough, um, so refractory or, or unexplained chronic cough with control or healthy volunteers, um, so this is giving them an irritant using, using capsaicin, there's increased cough frequency at a lower threshold. Um, so hypersensitivity 
or um, left shift of the curve, and there's also higher cough frequency or hyper responsiveness at the same level um, of irritation. So what other features to suggest they might have cough hypersensitivity? So longer duration of chronic cough, so minimally um, productive or dry cough, um, chronic throat irritation, um, and you know, chronic <clears throat> um, throat clearing. It could be due to multiple triggers, so innocuous stimuli, so changes in temperature, changes in humidity. So for some, it could be cold. Uh, for some, it could be warm. For others, it could be dry or, or moist. Um, talking, laughing, so you know, talking on the telephone triggers chronic cough. Dry food, so you know, in the past we thought maybe that's reflux, but in essence, dry food irritating um, the upper airway, um, and it's, you know, environmental irritants or um, you know, smells. And then for some patients, difficult to control the cough, so going into that coughing fit once triggered, unable to abate or stop the cough. So in terms of treatment objectives, it's to suppress the cough or reduce it, um, and, and thereby reducing the impact of chronic cough. So that's dampening down the cough hypersensitivity with the goal to improve their quality of life, um, but balancing against treatment side effects. Um, so the key me me um, messages, so ensure they're appropriately investigated and uh, uh, ensure that their other contributing factors or the treatable traits are um, adequately optimized. Um, and again, caution regarding using cough suppression and chronic productive cough. They so, um, you know, can work with a physiotherapist, um, but in essence, to make sure the productive component is adequately uh, expectorated or managed because that, that cough uh, reflex would be helpful. Um, you don't want to suppress a patient who is appropriately bringing up mucus. Unfortunately, there's no consensus or clinical data or confirmatory diagnostic test to say, yes, you've got, you know, cough, cough hypersensitivity. It's, it's still, um, you know, a syndrome rather than an actual diagnosis. And currently there's unfortunately no approved therapies available for refractory or an unexplained chronic cough. Um, but I will go on to talk about um, some of the data for available options being used off-label. So first is morphine or opiate. Um, it has, as we know, there's an anti-tussive effect. Um, it, the actual mechanism is unclear, but we suspect it activates the inhibitory control pathways um, and act via central uh, opiate receptors. Um, probably not just the mu, but potentially also kappa. Um, that will have some central antitussive effect. There's only been one trial, so low dose, um, slow release morphine sulfate. So double blind placebo control crossover RCT, small numbers, only 27, four week duration, five milligrams with the twice a day ability to up titrate to 10 milligrams. It just showed improvements in their uh, cough questionnaire um, as well as their cough diary. Um, Unfortunately, there are some side effects, as we know, so constipation, 40%, and drowsiness, 25%. Um, again, relatively low doses. Um, and it, unfortunately, only 50% you know, respond, and responders um, have a generally apparent by one to two weeks. So if they don't respond, you can you know, stop. Um, so the recommendations are different. So ERS guidelines, the 2020 guidelines recommend morphine. Um, as sort of a first line that you can consider to um, suppress the cough, however, not recommended in chest guidelines and not recommended um, by the uh, Lung Foundation. Um, I think there's always concern um, regarding sort of dependence um, as well as uh, the, the other side effects, as well as the lack of long-term data as chronic cough is always going to be a long-term long -term disease. Gabapentinoid, so um, neuromodulation of uh, central sensitization or inhibitory control um, through um, calcium channel as well as NMDA channels. Uh, there's been one RCT looking at gabapentin, and this was done in Australia, in Newcastle, um, by uh, Peter Gibson's group. So double blind placebo control, 10 weeks, maximal tolerable dose. So as you can see, 1800 milligrams, quite high doses. Um, there's improvements in cough um, questionnaire, cough frequency, and cough severity. Um, effect was not maintained, so they had five visits. So between visit four and five, um, it was stopped. 
And as you can see, the cough severity increased up upon cessation of treatment and the LCQ score no longer is significantly diff different at the end of treatment. Um, side effects, blurred vision disorientation, but mainly dizzy um, sort of drowsiness was the main issue in terms of tolerability. Um, there are some data looking at pregabalin, so shown to um, improve subjective cough measures when used with speech um, therapy than speech therapy alone. Uh, but um, uh, on its own, uh, the data has been disappointing. Uh, amitriptyline, uh, so one RCT mainly post-viral cough, only small observational data in RCC um, and UCC. So two-thirds responded after two to three months of treatment. One third was still on treatment at two, three year mark. Again, adverse effects, headache, dizziness, dry mouth, and somnolence, um, usually given at night. So maybe more helpful for those who are troubled by nocturnal cough impacting on their sleep. Uh, speech pathology, this is probably um, the main one. So it's delivered by a qualified speech pathologist over three to four sessions, um, plus or minus a laryngoscopy if it hasn't been done recently to you know, exclude excessive mucus or any upper airway abnormalities um, or any you know, vocal cord dysfunction or um, so forth. Um, so four main um, uh, components. So education, explaining the biology cough, explaining um, you know, the negative effects of um, excessive coughing, Give, you know, empowering the patient that they do have um, voluntary, voluntary control. So uh, getting them to set control. Um, cough su suppression techniques. So identifying their cough triggers and talk about trigger avoidance um, and some, some suppression techniques. So swallowing water. So that's, uh, so the swallow reflex dampens down the cough reflex, sipping, um, you know, chewing gum and some breathing techniques. So in through the nose, out through the mouth. So um, rather than mouth breathing, which um, irritates the larynx. Reducing laryngeal irritation. So adequate hydration, adequate fluid, avoiding or minimizing alcohol, caffeine. Again, we talked about nasal breathing, managing anything that could be irritating um, in terms of you know, nasal drip and reflux um, and voice therapy. Uh, and then psychoeducation, so motivating them to um, you know, adhere to treatment, um, talk about some of the stress and emotional control that comes with cough, um, setting realistic goals and um, sort of relaxation strategies that comes with, um, it, um, that can help with suppressing the cough. The mechanism is unclear, but you know, presumably cortical control, um, it's safe and effective, um, minimal side effects compared to pharmacotherapy. It's used as an adjunct or alternative treatment to neuromodulatory medications. There has been um, two RCTs, which shows you know, positive outcome compared to placebo. Uh, so we talked about some of the exclusions. So um, speech pathology generally would not accept referral without adequate respiratory, you know, gastro ENT um, exclusion of conditions if, if relevant, um, or if they've got abnormal lung function, you know, we talk about the productive cough. Um, although they can work in conjunction with uh, physio, chest physio, respiratory physiotherapy, um, one to act on the, you know, the dry cough, um, irritating cough component, while the other ensure there's adequate clearance of the phlegm. Unfortunately, excuse, um, excuse me, Dr. Zheng, I'm just letting you know there's a few questions to answer as well. So just to try and allow the time for that. Yep, I think it's almost wrapping it up. So future treatments, we talked about the P2X3 um, receptor. Um, so it's still, um, so there's several under development. Um, this is from a phase three trial um, published um, in Lancet um, and it has shown um, improvement. As you can see, there's a significant placebo, um, uh, placebo effect. So 53 to 57% improved. Um, it's two separate trial, one's 12 weeks, one's 24 weeks, um, 15 milligram, 45 milligrams, 45 milligram showed effect. The main adverse effect is um, taste um, dysgeusia, so taste change, um, which is reversible. Um, but there are new drugs in development um, which showed you know, greater um, response when compared to placebo and less taste-related adverse effect due to the selectivity uh, of the channel, so the P2X3 selective um, drugs. Um, in terms of future developments, there are a bunch of other 
um, drugs looking at, you know, menthol targets, um, uh, uh, lignocaine or lidocaine injections into the superior laryngeal nerve, again, through ENT um, to dampen the cough. Um, so uh, potentially exciting changes in processes, lots of billion dollar uh, investment in this area. Um, uh, there are some, unfortunately there's no cough clinic at St. George, but I you know, presume when those drugs become available, that might change. Um, and that would help some of the coordination of investigation um, and you know, multidisciplinary care. So we're not repeating things or, or the patients are not having long delays before you know, accepting the potential diagnosis of um, um, you know, cough hypersensitivity. And we need better understanding of the cough hypersensitivity. Um, and then obviously, um, you know, accessibility and availability of non-pharmacological, i.e. speech path um, uh, access. So we, we have an excellent speech pathologist um, at St. George um, who, you know, would accept referrals for those who are adequately worked up. Um, so just to, you know, finalise, um, so he's still in progress. <laughs> so continuing to optimise reflux, he's being um, treated with a incretin, so a six sender for weight loss, or now, now going on to Zempic. Um, again, we uh, monitor and emphasize the importance of treatment adherence, have discussed you know, options available pharmacotherapy. You know, not surprisingly, particularly given his weight um, and sleep apnea issues and drowsiness, he has opted um, to be seen by speech pathology as the, the sole treatment for the management of cough hypersensitivity. Um, so to summarize, you know, chronic cough frequent health can counter significant burden to patient and healthcare. Um, may reflect serious pathology. We talked about some of the red flags. Um, I will share some of the resources or guidelines um, later on. I will email um, to um, Kylie and I can pass it on. And um, we talked about the controversy or the unclear muddled waters of the big three. Um, and then introduced a idea of chronic cough in the setting of cough hypersensitivity. Uh, limited treatments currently, but you know, potential exciting drug treatments in the future. Um, and I'll take questions. Sorry, I went over time. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to choose the most salient of the um, questions and see how we go for time. Mm -hmm. One was, um, what dose of inhaled corticosteroids do we use in post-viral cough? I thought it was a much higher dose than normal pre prevention. Uh, post-viral cough. Um, I usually put them on sort of 400 um, BD of Pomacort. Mm -hmm. um, but I, look, I, I guess I'm not aware of the evidence base behind it between higher or lower doses. Um, same with the chronic cough, I think. We generally, because it might be just a short-term trial, we usually use higher doses with a view that we, you know, if they've got treatment, if they have treatment response, which I didn't cover in this talk, you wind it back and wind it down. Yeah, thank you. Um, many patients don't want to take a PPI after um, some media suggesting an increased dementia risk with people taking PPIs. Um, so the question is, how effective are H2 antagonists compared to PPIs for a reflux type cough. Um, I, yeah, so as we discussed, the, the H2 and PPI um, no longer recommended as a general, um, you know, give to everyone with chronic cough unless they have um, active reflux. Um, so active gourd symptoms in terms of, you know, um, heartburn or refluxate symptoms. Um, in those who do have those symptoms, um, PPI um, would be my treatment of choice. I'm sorry, I'm not a gastroenterologist. Um, I probably over-prescribe PPI. Um, uh, in terms of um, uh, issues with, you know, discussion with patient, I, I think it's, again, with chronic cough, it's always a balance between, um, you know, treatment side effects from one drug versus the impact of their chronic cough. Um, uh, and again, um, the emphasis these days is non-pharmacological approach. Um, so addressing their weight gain, address, addressing their lifestyle, uh, modifying their diet, um, modifying you know their pre-bedtime you know habits and um, and so forth. And 
Um, so I usually provide patients a pamphlet or patient education to document the, all the excellent foods that they can't have. Um, <laughs> and and the, the, some of the lifestyle modifications. I'm not sure how much they uptake it, um, to be honest, particularly, you know, the brick under the bed or the books under the bed. Uh, there's yeah, another that's... question because um, some a lot of things have changed since COVID and one of them is the access to spirometry. Um, so the question is where can GPs get spirometry done because the pathology centres don't offer it anymore. Oh, okay. And, okay. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, we do spirometries in our department. Um, I think we do do a, yeah, I'm pretty sure we do a rat test before we mm. do the spirometry. Um, the scientists wear a um, in, like appropriate PPE and 95 mask. Um, we do do bronchoprovocation challenge, which was more of a concern and that was stopped, which you might've noticed why um, you know, patient number two has yet to have a bronchoprovocation challenge. Mm. Uh, we, we are, in, in essence, we're doing all of it in the public lab as well as private labs. There are some new guidelines since COVID basically saying you should screen the patient first and if they don't have a febrile illness and, you know, not concerned, then it's probably okay to do spirometry if, as long as you have inline filters. And uh, there is a health pathway um, on spirometry testing that identifies some of the resources for getting spirometry done to help the questioner. Um, there's also a question about how do we diagnose possible asthma cough at night, atopic, if we see them in the daytime and they have normal spirometry? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so cough at night, query yeah. nocturnal asthma. Um, yes. So I guess it will go back to the bronchoprovocation challenge um, in terms of, um, you know, whether there is um, leakiness or um, evidence they are, they're hyperreactive. Um, in terms of ATP at night, is that more like dust mite or does that sort of... I think they're just saying that the patient has other signs of ATP, yeah. so their suspicion, you know, suspecting asthma at night, but they mm. can't prove it during the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess without, hypothetically, without access to the um, spirometry um, and bronchoprovocation challenge and pheno, um, again, if it's sort of an allergic pathway or evidence of active airway inflammation, their pheno should be raised. Um, then uh, the, these recent guidelines support an empirical trial of two to four weeks of ICS and see if they respond. Um, in terms of the allergen workup, um, you know, there are labs that do skin prick tests. Um, blood eosinophil might be a surrogate marker. Um, uh, if for those who don't have ready access to pheno, but you know, uh, most private labs and public labs are happy to accept any patients for a spiro pheno, um, and most centres also do bronchoprovocation challenge if, if requested. Um, there's a question about pertussis, uh, and I think I might make this the last question and let the other people with questions know, because we are going over time, that we'll forward the rest of the questions to Bertha to be forwarded to you, Dr. Zing, and we'll ask you to answer them offline and we can send them to the participants. Uh, the question about pertussis is it's common in adolescents unless they have had their vaccine updated mm -hmm. and also in older adults, and it's, it's, um, they the questioner says it's called the one-year cough in other cultures, yeah. certainly called the 100-day cough in, in Australia. Yeah. Um, how can we tell if the cough is due to this and does anything different help? Um, for example, high-dose inhaled steroids, and would you do serology to see if it's due to this? Uh, I have done so um, with some of the patients, and sometimes it depends... Um, the nature of their cough. Um, you know, by the time they see me, mostly it's that they don't have the typical symptoms and it might be just, uh, you know, post-viral irritating cough. Um, I didn't talk about post-viral cough, but certainly if it's protracted and, and I think the inflammatory nature, and I didn't talk about COVID-19, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Probably. Also we might all be relieved that you didn't talk slide, about actually. it. <laughs> um, yeah, so in essence, um, all it, they are sort of pro-inflammatory, irritate the eye, um, airway, 
is more secretions, it's inflammatory damage or epithelial damage itself from the cough. We talked about cough begets coughing. Um, I suspect part of it is sort of a neuro pathway hyperactivation or hyper responsiveness um, uh, with post viral cough. And oftentimes, when we do screen the patients um, that will go through their history, um, their initial trigger or insult was a virus. Um, they got better, um, but their cough continued and the cough never went away. And sometimes they do just improve over time, but takes longer. Um, again, it's more just identifying treatable traits that will, anything we can modify. In terms of the viral, yeah, the post viral component, I'm not aware of any specific treatment that would actually help. Um, I would probably focus on sort of the simple speech path mentioned things, you know, education, hydration, um, uh, keeping their larynx well hydrated and away, away from irritants. And I guess the promise that it's going to eventually go away. Yeah. Um, Bertha, I'll hand over to you, but thank you. Or they go see someone else, but yes. <laughs> Bertha, I'll hand over to you to close the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you, Martina. Thank you very much, Dr. Zeng, for your time tonight and for that excellent presentation. Um, thank you, Dr. Gleason, for facilitating the questions. As was mentioned, any questions that weren't covered in tonight's um, uh, discussion, we will send to the speaker to answer your questions and then circulate that to the group. So thank you so much for attending. Um, you will receive the evaluation survey popping up on the screens once I close the session and GPs will receive a copy of the measuring outcome activity um, at some point tomorrow. So just keep an eye out in your emails. Again, thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your night.